We have Brian London, who is a tourism economist here in the room. Some of you may have worked with Brian back in 2019 when we did our strategic plan. Brian speaks at conferences, gosh, all across the country. Um, you'll see why he's in such high demand with his quick wit and good information that he gives you. Um, but at this time, Brian, if you would come up and just kind of give a quick snippet of what you're going to talk about, and this will be after the Tourism Awards. But I wanted Brian to come up just real quick so you all have a better understanding of, of why you should stick around. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. Oh, if you want more money, I'm going to get you more money. <laughs> if, if you're looking to lose a few pounds, I'm going to make sure you lose those pounds. And um, I, I know everyone wants to be a little bit better looking. I'm going to make sure you're better looking. But of course, you're already better looking. So um, my promise to you is, um, I'm not going to talk about any numbers or date, you know, real kind of hard data. I'm just going to talk about some uh, broad-based trends that help others predict the future. And if you're interested in predicting the future or if you have your own ideas and you want to bounce them off me, you want to see if your ideas for the future are similar to mine, stick around. Um, if you have no idea what the future holds, well, then you're really going to get a lot out of this session because I'll tell you. Um, in fact, you can just think of me as being from the future. And I'm here to present to you uh, what I saw. And when I'm done, I'll go back to the future, where uh, everybody's uh, rich and handsome and uh, thin. OK, thank you. Thank you, Brian. In all seriousness, Brian brings great, credible information um, with data to back it. So it's always been very helpful to me whenever I hear him speak at conferences. So we're really excited to have him here. He's also going to stick around overnight. And we're having an art and culture stakeholder meeting tomorrow morning at 930 at the chamber. Um, he's helped a lot of groups. We've talked with the Caladium Festival and the, the Soda Festival. And he's given them a lot of great ideas that they've been able to implement into their program. So the next person I wanted to introduce real quick is Joel Lamp. Joel is with Airstream Ventures, and Airstream Ventures is based in Jacksonville. They are our sports marketing company, and Joel is going to give a quick snapshot of what we've been doing with sports. If you've seen things like motorized surfboard racing and jet ski racing and more golf tournaments come in the area, that's all due to Joel and his team. So we just wanted to update everybody on what's going on in the, the world of Highlands County sports. Thanks. Uh, I, unfortunately, my DeLorean broke down, so uh, I, I'm, I'm straight from uh, the present. Um, so uh, we're excited uh, about the future of sports in Sebring uh, in Highlands County. Uh, we came on board in February to uh, start marketing Sebring in the county as a sports destination in We've got an amazing uh, response from the sports world, and our focus, you're going to see more racing. Um, Sebring is known, people know Sebring because of the 12-hour race. So how do we take that and brand us as a racing destination? So we don't care if it's cars, lawnmowers, humans, surfboards, gerbils, you name it, racing-wise, we're talking to them to try to get them to do a race here uh, in the area. Um, you'll see in uh, December, we have the first Spartan Tough Mudder joint race coming. This thing is the biggest event that we feel like we can bring to Sebring outside the 12 hour race. And so uh, we're looking to have uh, somewhere between 12 to 15,000 participants coming in for a weekend where they pay a lot of money to go get their butt kicked uh, on a five, 5K course. So it's really awesome to see. So um, that that's kind of our goal on the racing side is to continue to brand Sebring as a racing destination. And then we've done a, a lot of work in the golf world to get events going. So you're gonna see three tournaments coming up in November in December, and we've got plans for some more stuff uh, in the golf world going forward. Uh, we've got a great relationship with the minor league golf tour that's really uh, flourishing uh, in South Florida and bringing them up here. So we're excited about doing a, you'll see a lot of golf stuff coming down the pipe. And then you're going to see us do a lot of different random events that sometimes may not, you would like, how is that here? Um, we've got a, uh, we had a youth wrestling tournament this past uh, summer. We're going to bring them back uh, next summer. And we're looking at a lot of those youth sports and niche sports that uh, aren't mainstream, but they bring a lot of people and they have a, a residual uh, impact from marketing, whether it's TV, YouTube, all those things. That's, that's, you know, when we look at events, we're looking for three things, heads and beds, uh, economic impact and community impact. 
and then a residual marketing opportunity. And so we feel like we've got a, a really strong sleigh of stuff coming uh, in 22, um, in especially uh, when we get the pickleball stuff going. So uh, we're excited about what's going on in the future and uh, look forward to uh, working more with you guys here in Highlands County. Thanks, Casey. Thank you, Joel. And just um, for those of you that, that kind of want to know how we gauge our success, we really look at every month, we look at the collections that we bring in from the hotel tax, which is a 4% tax on people staying in our hotels and our Airbnbs. So I will tell you that this year, this our fiscal started October of last year, has been pretty much a home run for us. Um, October brought a big GFNY cycling event, like when nobody else was doing events. Um, the 12 hours got shifted to November, and then Joel and his group started bringing things in right away when we started working with them. So um, it's been a really good year for us, um, despite dealing with COVID and a pandemic. I know we're all kind of dealing with things still, like a residual effect, um, but that makes the recognition of this year's participants for their uh, customer service and their efforts in 2020, all that more um, important this year moving forward. Thank you everyone for sticking around. We're actually going to get started. Brian has only like 43 slides to go through. No, I'm just kidding. He has no slides actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> he can do it all from memory because he's that good. Yes. It's the Avenue Q version. Um, so anyway, so I just, again, wanted to introduce Brian London. He is our, I just call him our strategic planner extraordinaire. Yeah. Um, he's an amazing speaker. I mean, he's literally asked to go all over the country to speak about tourism, predict the future of tourism. Um, but he's got some really great data to back it up, and he always has some amazing examples. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian London for our tourism insights. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for holding your applause until the end. Joel, thank you. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, yep. Uh, my name is Brian London, and I am an economist. That means, of course, I'm a lot of fun at parties and uh, social events. This will be like a private briefing for those of you in the room, like a one-on-one. Like -on -one. So if I say something that is just really interesting or, or um, valuable, and you want to talk about it further, just interrupt me. Let me know. In fact, if you interrupt me during the presentation, that'll be my signal that I've said something really profound to inspire you to, uh, to talk about it. And if you decide just to listen, that's okay too. That'll be my signal that the things I'm sharing are so profound that you just don't want to interrupt and you've got to just take as many notes as possible. Okay. I think... I was, the, I was the news guy. He's gone. Now you can say whatever you want. Yeah, now you can interrupt and say. So I, um, I got my start as an economist. I was doing about 20 years ago. You can think of it like that. I started 20 years ago. And today's presentation has been 20 years in the making. So you're about to hear my greatest presentation ever. So the Tallahassee Airport had this problem 20 years ago. Um, and that is that people that lived around the airport, which is known as the catchment area, the number of people who live near the airport, the, the Tallahassee airport thinks they should be flying out of the airport because they live so close. But that wasn't the case. There weren't that many people traveling from the airport, and the Tallahassee uh, government wanted to know why. And that's how I got my start in economics um, and this kind of strategic planning and, and pricing strategy. And um, from there, I developed these theories about money and communities and businesses and why some businesses are prosperous and other businesses uh, take a little bit longer to prosper. And the short answer is um, it has to do with friction, right? Things that get in the way from doing what you know needs to be done. And we can think about friction in four categories. Uh, Time, talent, treasure, and tribe. So time is just all of these competing priorities that you have, right? All these good ideas. Talent would be maybe the skills. You might not have the skills you need to uh, do the things that need doing. 
Treasure, of course, there's never enough money to reallocate. And tribe, you know, you, you might be hanging out with the wrong people. <laughs> and, and now's your chance to change. But you can also mix and mingle these things, right? Maybe you know someone with more money or you know someone with available time or whatever the case may be. But if you're able to sort out these kind of four levers, then communities uh, who do so tend to prosper more quickly. And what this prosperity looks like is money circulating. That's, that's it. Money circulates in an economy. And the more it circulates and the faster it circulates, the more prosperous a community can be. And that's what makes tourism so fascinating, is it, it's this outside money coming in and circulating. And all you really have to do to activate it is have the right mix of time and talent and treasure and tribe. And if you can do that, then you have this economic prosperity. Simple enough. Uh, look at that, 20 years and, and two minutes. So I'm able to transfer this knowledge to you. So this friction that we have um, is made worse or better by external forces. These are things that we cannot control. And that makes life difficult when you can't control things. But if you can be aware of them, if you can kind of peek around the corner and anticipate what's going to happen, then you can at least adjust. You can pull on those levers for your time or your talent, right? If you know um, that something is going to come, if you know a new core is going to be built in the community, you know, maybe you can start to, to train up residents in order to fill those jobs, for example. So all these things are, are at play. The six categories that you cannot control um, are your children, your spouse, no, I'm just kidding, are um, economics. You can't control anything going on in the broader economy, at least at the individual level. You know what I mean? If, if they want to shut the government down, they're going to shut it down. You know, we, we can't do anything about that. Um, there's demographics, demographic trends, right? These are the generations. There's lifestyle trends. Um, technology trends, regulatory trends, and then, of course, uh, political trends. Today, I'm just going to do a brief overview of these. And uh, as I'm sharing them, I want you to, you can either be calling them out, like things that you identify, or just think about, like, how serious are these trends at the national or state level or local level? And uh, do you have the resources in the right place to take advantage of them? And then, in conclusion, I'll show you four ways that communities are able to marshal their resources to take advantage of these trends, right? Again, they can't control them. It's just kind of like the tide of time. But you can position yourself to ride that tide um, as well, as well as you can. All right, sounds fair? Everyone sounds, sounds good? I see some head nodding. And Okay, who wants to go first? What's the biggest economic news that you're kind of hearing? And uh, I'll nominate Joel. Joel, what's the biggest economic headline that you uh, have heard about? Yeah, government shutting down. What are you doing about that? Prank. Prank. Yeah. Um, so Joel's right, right? The government is thinking about shutting down. And that means they uh, are not going to pay their current financial obligations. And a whole host of cascading issues will come of that, including um, a recessionary environment. Now, uh, bankers have already suggested that the economy is not going to grow as quickly um, for the end of the year. At first, right back in January, February, March, when we were getting our stimulus checks, they were predicting growth of seven or eight percent, and now they've brought that down to um, to three or four percent. So things are already starting to slow down. And now news reports. Did you see my? my thing? Yeah. Can you get me? I got one. I'm going to take a pause for everybody to think about that for a second. The force of my ideas had, had broken my mask <laughs> to give you an idea of how heavy these are. Okay, so, um, so, so savings was high, right? And uh, there was stimulus spending and GDP was going to be high, but now it's going to be low. And now there's going to be a government shutdown. And that's just wreaking havoc on um, our, our mental state, our, our confidence. If you look at readings of consumer confidence, they're down for the third straight month in a row. 
that's national in Florida. They're down as well, four months in a row. And when consumer confidence is down, that means consumers are holding onto their pocketbooks a little bit tighter. They're not as likely to open them up and spend money on leisure activities like travel and tourism. So that's something to keep in mind, right? If, if that's not going to take place, what can we do? What levers can we pull to take advantage of that? Let's just kind of hold that in suspense for a little bit and talk about these other five factors. On the demographic side, Joel, do you want to recommend anybody to talk about generations and the demographics? Casey, Casey what, uh, what generation are you? <laughs> you how old I am? Joel, Joel, Joel uh, pointed you out here. Not a millennial. Mm -hmm. Good transition. Yeah. So millennials are actually making the highest household income of any generation at their current age. A millennial household currently brings in $85,000 a year, which is the most of other generations when they were also at that current age of what millennials are, if that makes sense. However, they have the least amount of total wealth. Their share of the total wealth is just 5%. Whereas other generations, such as boomers um, at, at the age that millennials are now, um, was close to 35%. And the reason is, even though they're making more money, things cost more money. And so making more is kind of no longer the point because their quality of life is, is lower because everything costs more money. By the way, have you heard that everything's costing more money? <laughs> and this is, yeah. And uh, we'll see how this cascades and impacts all other factors, such as lifestyle, which is our third factor. The biggest lifestyle trend is work from anywhere. And essentially, the, the end of the 40-hour work week, this kind of factory hangover of structured time at your desk, at your office, clock in, punch out, uh, an hour for lunch, it is over. Um, and that means that the working class um, can pursue their passions from anywhere they want. Now, anywhere in the state of Florida or anywhere in the country is available for them to be. Their leisure time and their work time are combined. There is no more separation. At once uh, in Tours of Marketing, we spoke about uh, a mixing a business trip with leisure, right? They come for the event, they stay an extra day to kind of poke around. Well, leisure. <laughs> le leisure. Now, the, their entire life is, is leisure. You know, it's the life of Riley for a lot of generations. And uh, that means uh, tourism marketing is competing also with economic development and all of these relocation packages. You probably heard like in West Virginia where they're paying um, to have people relocate to work from anywhere, for example. A lot of the islands are doing something similar with their visa waivers. And so it's, you know, there's a real big competition for people now who can do their job from anywhere. And that's going to impact city governments in terms of making sure that they have the infrastructure in place to handle these folks. Imagine if um, you went somewhere expecting you know, a Wi-Fi connection and it didn't work. And now all of a sudden this idea of working from anywhere is no longer valid. Well, if we don't invest in that infrastructure, um, then, then residents are not going to consider you know, that this has a high quality of life. By the way, does anybody know how Wi-Fi even works? I don't. Next is technology. All right, so here's the, here's the theory on technology. Bear with me. Systems with heavy traffic are candidates for optimization, right? If there's a bottleneck somewhere, then a lot of people are spending time trying to figure out how to remove that bottleneck. So just because there's not a problem um, doesn't mean technology is not there to solve it. It just means technology hasn't solved it yet. But technology is likely to solve everything. Um, if you think about virtual reality or augmented reality or cryptocurrencies, um, what technology has in common is that it, it cut out the middleman. And so if you're thinking, oh, you know, services are always going to rule the day, well, that's, that's no longer true because this new idea of software as a service is starting to prolifer proliferate, as well as the service of helping you pronounce words. And so if you think about um, systems with heavy traffic in your world, and whether or not technology has solved them or not, then you can kind of, again, peek around the corner and see the future for what's likely to happen. So for example, uh, yesterday in the news, the uh, federal um, FAA, the Aviation Administration, came out and said, there's new software to help airlines um, reduce the, the wait time at the gate. If you've ever kind of like, if your plane's ever arrived early, 
but you couldn't get to your gate because the other plane was there waiting. Um, this new software will, will help overcome that. And um, that's a bottleneck, right, that, that technology is saving. Same thing with cars. You know, when's the last time you went anywhere and um, didn't use your map feature like on your phone, for example? And um, even if you know where you're going, it's just kind of like the security blanket that you use the map feature because there's different routes or maybe you know there could be a high traffic area. So these are systems that people use every day and it impacts how they think about systems. And so if I'm in Jacksonville and I think that um, 45 minutes is a long time to get from one place to the other, and then I visit Sebring and it only takes 20 minutes to get from one place to the other, then I'm happy. But locally you, you might be thinking, oh my God, I can't believe it's 20 minutes to get across town. So you have to keep in mind these different perspectives and how technology might uh, play into that. Uh, next is a regulatory environment. Okay, so who wants to talk about vacation rentals? Any county commissioners here? Want to talk about the vacation rental regulation? Not into that bed tax regulations, mask mandate, zoning, alcohol to go, food trucks. All of these uh, regulatory systems are impacting travelers' choice for where they want to go. Um, if I feel like uh, something is unregulated, me or my spouse are less likely to consider it um, as a travel destination. You know, I want to know that something is, my wife wants to know that something is regulated and safe, and, um, and if it's not, then that, that takes away the chance of selecting that destination. So, and the opposite, that's right. I'm gonna talk about these wedge issues in just a second. Thank you, and, which is a great transition to the final category, politics, which I know you've all been waiting to talk about. So the theme in politics is that every issue is now a wedge issue. I mean, it's like, if you see someone park their car wrong in the parking lot, you're probably like, oh, that's a so-and-so supporter, you know? You just kind of like assign them this, uh, this big brand because if they do something that you don't like. And so the idea uh, before that politics was local, right? The great Tip O'Neill had once said that all politics is local. But now we're finding a little bit of a reversal for that. We're finding you know, all, all politics is national. And even local candidates are trying to really latch themselves on to these big national issues and these big national candidates uh, in order to get more traction. And uh, we're seeing this like in different travel alerts where you can't travel to different destinations. We're seeing this in the way that um, currently that like data is collected and distributed um, as it relates to the pandemic. And whether or not you have an opinion on that, if, if you just kind of set that aside for a second and acknowledge that there's different pieces of information available to the consumer. And the pieces of information that are available are not standardized. And that's the issue. Not that one piece of information is correct or incorrect, but that the information being shared is not standard. And so imagine if you were looking for hotel room rates and you looked for a rate and it said it was you know, $105, and then you called the hotel and they said it was $115, and then you, know, you checked back and you then went to check in and it was a whole third price, right? It just wasn't standard. So what politics is, needs to do, what you can kind of peek around the corner and understand is that the more convoluted the message, the more uh, that messages are not standard in terms of uh, public health, the more weary people are, are gonna be about traveling to certain destinations. Now, you have these internal levers, okay? This time, talent, treasure, tribe. And you've got these external forces kind of coming in on you. And you're like, oh my God, what should I do? You know, I don't want to get into the politics of what's happening. Um, you know, the economics is, is broad enough. You know, it, it impacts everybody, but some people are immune. You know, you can't change demographic generations, but we can understand that some generations have an affinity to the destination as opposed to other de you know, generations. Um, we know that work from home means there's you know, no more idea of kind of weekday versus weekend. Every day is a weekend, and it's kind of work from anywhere environment. Um, you know, so what do we do? Well, I'm glad you asked. So there's four things that destinations are doing to take advantage of this, and uh, I'm kind of wrapping up here in the last 10 minutes. So the first is they're trying to do things that are operationally uh, innovative. And the way they do this is through something called the journey map. And a journey map helps an organization or a destination 
um, identify opportunities. So here's a quick sample of a journey map from a business I worked with, a, a hair salon. So this hair salon um, has an, a technology interface, an app, right, where you get a, a message and it says, uh, your appointment is tomorrow, press one to confirm, two to cancel. And if you press two to cancel, then you get a follow-up message. We're sorry that you had to cancel. Uh, click this link to reschedule your appointment online. And then you go online and guess what it says? It says, please call uh, to schedule your appointment for your hair service, right? So there's this disconnect in the journey from what the, the business wants the consumer to do and what the consumer's actual journey is. And, and these disconnects happen all the time, right? If you've ever been, if you've ever thought that the customer should know something that they don't, that's a disconnect. And if the customer's ever thought, oh man, I wish I knew that before I moved forward, you know, that's another example of a disconnect. So the first response are these marketing and operational innovations and the process is through journey mapping. And what we see that materialized as are these kind of these apps on your phone or these, uh, as you heard earlier, these geocaching challenges. So think about the history of this here, right? Destinations used to just list all the things to do in the guidebook. And then they had these innovations, right? They, they iterated and moved forward. And then they took these list of things to do and they put them into an, an itinerary. And then the itinerary evolved into a tour, right? Or a passport. And now we're even seeing these passports develop into these challenges. Right? It's not enough to know about the thing. Now they challenge you to complete the actual items. Uh, and sometimes they can incentivize you with, with prizes and stamps and so on and so forth. So marketing and operational innovation is the biggest response to these external forces. The next is a brand focus on consumer segments. We have to acknowledge that um, not all markets are worth the same amount to us. Some customers and clients cost more to service some uh, you know, don't pay as much or are not as profitable. Some are worth more than others. We need to understand those perceptions and, um, and then focus on those segments. You heard Joel talk earlier about positioning as a racing destination, right? We're gonna own the category of racing. And this elevates the destination from its, its activity, right, of the car race into all sorts of racing that you can now own. And that's a focus, an example of a focus on the consumer segment, so job well done on that. The third category is infrastructure investment. This is spending money, right? This is your treasure lever that you can pull. Now, the bad news is it's an arms race out there. Every destination has the, the local option, right? Tourist development tax, and they're all focused on increasing the revenue that comes from that. Uh, we recently had a big round of federal funds being distributed to communities, some communities reallocated that money to tourism. Uh, many communities are focused on building or expanding convention centers, um, evolving welcome centers into experience centers, um, putting a ton of advertising and marketing in known markets as well as exploratory markets. But for those that can invest in the infrastructure, for those that can answer the question, what's new? Those are the destinations that will have the competitive advantage. Um, because remember, to encourage the traveler um, to, to visit, uh, you, you're competing, right? You're competing against uh, other destinations, um, other activities, uh, other, other uses for that money, and then other uses of their time. So you really have to be kind of hitting all four of those, right? The sweet spot in order to activate a real, a real kind of visitor. And the fourth and final category is brand awareness um, and exposure. You've got to amplify these current messages. Um, sometimes this could be known as a kind of like an astroturf marketing. But if you could imagine there's a, a message coming out from the Tourism Bureau, and now you've got 20 partners who can all pile onto that message, right, and interact with it through social media. Now you're creating this wave of activity that others on social media are able to, to see and build on that otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So just the idea that you have activity is not really the, the goal here. The goal is to amplify that activity, to bring your brand awareness and exposure out into the marketplace in ways that were not um, otherwise available to you. And so you're gonna amplify this, you're gonna have this kind of astroturf marketing approach, 
um, and also have this segmented marketing approach. It's very difficult to be all things to all people. But if you can focus the me message on those that are most likely to activate a visit to the destination, then you have the highest chance of actually converting them to come visit. So, okay, that's about a 25 minute brief overview of what's happening um, outside of this room. Okay, there are all these forces at play and all the forces you can kind of filter and think about through those six categories, right? It's either an economic challenge, it's a demographic shift, it's a lifestyle preference, it's a technology development, could be a regulatory development or even a, a political development. And as these things are happening, you have to determine which of those internal levers you're gonna pull. Okay, does this require more of my time? Uh, does this require some of my talent? Does this require some of my treasure? Or does this require you know, some of my tribe to get involved? And what you do with those four pieces of information is now you apply them. And you can apply them into these four categories. You can be more innovative. Uh, you can have your brand focused um, on your consumer segments. You can invest in your infrastructure or you can have brand awareness and exposure. Destinations that are able to do those four things um, well are destinations that are having a competitive advantage in this new landscape. And uh, more to the point, destinations that do those four things well are seeing prosperity in their communities at a faster rate than destinations that are not able to do those things. And that makes sense, right? If you know what needs to be done and you do them, then you know the outcome is going to be positive. And you know if you take your foot off the gas, right, and you don't do something, then you have to be willing to accept the consequence of not doing the work that you know needs to be done. So this is the lay of the land. This is a kind of a brief little uh, briefing for you. I invite any questions or case studies that you might want to talk about. Um, and if I can answer them directly, I will. And if I can't answer them directly, I will be uh, happy to try to follow up with you afterwards. Thank you. Oh yeah. Which comes out every weekday. Mm -hmm. And it's great because it's a snippet of information about what's going on in things like airlines, um, restaurants, hotels, and you can kind of scroll down and see. It's really good to see what other destinations are doing, what other breweries are doing, what other performing arts centers are doing. Um, so if you if you do want to subscribe to that, let me know. I will forward you the information. But Brian has a mm -hmm. wealth of knowledge wealth of information and knowledge because he puts this together. So he sees what other destinations are I find very helpful. Um, and I bounce things off him all the time. Hey, Brian, we're doing this. What do you think? He's like, well, did you think about this? Mm -hmm. like, oh, I didn't think about that. That's good to, to know when moving forward with this project. So um, now's the time. You've got it. Oh, yeah. I can. Oh, yes, ma'am. I have a comment to make. Um, I was, uh, on Sunday, I was in Sarasota. Yeah. There's a new art museum there. It's in the old high school. Mm hmm and they did a really good job. They have a free day once a month. On other days to the newer museum. And on Sunday, that was their free day. It's offered at the end of the month. So I think it's important for museums and attractions to offer a free day. That gives people the opportunity to visit that may not be able to. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just, I, I, I mean, I know that, you know, like in Chicago, the Art Institute and the Museum of Contemporary Art, they always make mm -hmm. Well, that's a very innovative and a, and a solid pricing strategy, right? To get people through the door, um, complimentary, so they can see what it is. And, um, and then it's also very making them culturally aware of what's in the destination. And uh, we know that museums and facilities that do this um, during the weekday um, have visitors that actually stay on property longer. They're there longer um, because they don't, f um, they feel at ease. You know, so that's a good idea. Um, the park's free, right? 
Sorry, that was, that was a bad joke. That's right, yeah. So tying those two together, doing this bilingual story hour, I've moved it to October because of dodging hurricanes in September. Mm -hmm. September is the worst month for dodging storms. Mm -hmm. so, so we thought it would be safer to move it to October. And then just, so those people that come, they'll be able to, by presenting a library card or bring a library book or, bring, or donating it's a great program and i'll just piggyback off of that a lot of destinations have programs uh, where your library card can serve as an attractions pass you can check out an attractions pass the same way you can check out a book so the the library purchases you know 100 passes to the zoo and uh, then people just use their library card, they get a pass to the zoo, right? So there's a lot of innovative ways that you can um, encourage um, cross-pollination of attendance to these events. It's, um, I, the, the one thing I will add for the benefit of the group is that we're learning that it's not enough to have those ideas. What really activates it in the market is to bring in your partners and your tribe, right? And to have them help promote this concept and really be present and amplify the message um, because otherwise what ends up happening is you know it's always that one person who's working overtime who's scrambling to get all of these things together and the community is aware of them but they're not really pitching in the way that you need them to so I would encourage just kind of keep that in mind yes Um, thank you for your question. Um, so um, I'm going to answer your question twice. First, let me answer it directly, um, and then let me expand on it a little bit. Uh, no, I'm not seeing any fall off um, in the, those that are participating in the activity. Okay, that's your short answer. The longer answer is uh, it's still too soon to know what's going to fall off and uh, what, what is cool about that trend is that it, it's a reminder that there was never a demand problem. There's actually a supply problem. Um, golf pros are, you know, they were unprepared for the number of lessons they were going to have to give, for example. Um, courses were unprepared for the pace of play that was going to happen from new players, um, for example. Um, bosses were unprepared, you know, for not being able to reach their employees. So, so there's actually this supply issue. Um, staffing, for example, um, that really needs to shake out um, in the ski industry, which is not what you asked about, but we can use that uh, as a projection for golf. Um, what happened at, in the ski industry was um, the ski industry revenue is fragmented between um, ski school, which is where you go one time to learn, and then your pass, right, where you can go down the mountain, up the gondola, down the mountain. And what these mountains saw was um, an overwhelming amount of people who are skipping ski school, going straight up the gondola, and creating a negative experience for everyone else on the mountain um, for various reasons. That's a short version of what was happening out west. And so they had to pivot and try to encourage new skiers to go through the ski school system um, and also had to start pricing themselves in a way that limited access to the mountain. Um, because too many people 
created a negative experience for the activity. And so when that took place, you had some skiers that said, well, you know what, this is not for me. I want a, a laid back approach. I don't want to be governed. And um, in golf, fortunately, um, you don't have to be on the course to enjoy the activity. Okay, ski, you've got to be on the mountain to enjoy skiing. If you have uh, something like Top Golf, so Top Golf introduces supply, right? It's an available <coughs> activity in the market um, that you can do besides just being on the course. And now you can start to shift those interested in the sport over to something that has a little bit more of a, a feel of entertainment. And so it's not the pure kind of golfer. It's really the, the person looking for leisure activity in, a, in an entertaining way, maybe less concerned with who the course architect is or, or things of that nature. So the longer, longer answer to your question is um, business owners and communities need to also figure out the supply issue while trying to answer the demand issue. Um, there's no evidence that suggests these, these um, outdoor activities, which have gained popularity in the last 18 months, will, will wane anytime soon. Um, in fact, data from golfers suggest that lapsed golfers, those that played you know, previously but then have lapsed, um, have actually returned back to the course um, in greater numbers than new golfers, right? And so, um, so that's great because they already have a certain kind of knowledge of the game and can just pick up where they left off. So if you do our destination with this kind of outdoor activity, um, trails, uh, golf courses, different amenities of that nature, water, um, ramp, boat ramps, um, you are expected to maintain your competitive advantage probably for the next three years. Now, that means uh, three years and one day is going to be a great time to buy a boat because there's going to be a lot of boats for sale um, in the marketplace. Uh, probably not so great to buy a boat today. You know, hard to buy a used car today, for example. Um, expensive to buy a boat. Yeah. Do you play golf? You do? Yeah. Are you more interested in um, the, the course architect or the slope rating or... Um, where the, the beverage cart is located. Yeah. Yeah, the out and backs are better because you can just turn. So that's a good question. Yeah, in fact, um, if you look at Florida data, you'll see um, rural communities or, or we'll say non-meetings-based um, destinations uh, are gaining market share over destinations that relied heavily on business travel. In my home market of Jacksonville, Florida, 90% um, of the business there is leisure, whereas generally the mix was about 70 business, 30 leisure. And so uh, I guess the, the, um, the inside you know, talk is it's a good thing we don't have a convention center in Jacksonville because um, cause we wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been so difficult. Um, it would have been more difficult right, to have lost all that business like we saw in major uh, business markets like Austin, San Francisco, Orlando, Miami. Well, those are two great questions. Um, for those that ask questions, I have a $100 bill waiting for you oh, afterwards. Oh, now we have more questions. <laughs> but I, I did, you talked about the passports. And yeah. you have a SIPS trail pass mm. that we haven't seen performing to what we would like it to be performing. No. Twofold, um, some issues on the, the usability mm -hmm. that side which we're trying to work out, but then also from a partner standpoint, Ooh, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard. The, um, what others have done is um, they've created a core group of partners that they can count on to, um, to do the activity that needs doing. And if you start with them and then um, highlight, you know, re how's that phrase go? It's like uh, praise in public. And uh, how's it go? Any, any managers in the room? Pri yeah, cr criticize in private and, and praise in public. So, so what I've seen other destinations do is, is praise in public those that are helping the organization get closer to the goal. And uh, hopefully that kind of peer pressure rubs off and then uh, everybody does the thing they know they need to do. Um, but it does take a lot of time 
to do that. That's the lever you have to pull. You have to put in the sweat equity in order to get them to do that. And then the results, of course, if, if they're patient enough to wait for the results. On the activation of the passports, um, we see these programs fall into three categories. One is a kid-specific category. You know, it's gotta be it's something for children. Um, this, the second, the middle category, is kind of this broad-based thematic, um, go to these 10 places and get your stamp. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. And then the third category are these um, digital-based trails where you're just kind of checking in. You know, you're there, you press the button, um, the amplification's baked into the program. And uh, those are the programs that are having the most traction now because um, it's touchless, you don't have to interact with people, you can do it um, without you know, making a scene or anything, and uh, it just seems to be popular. You know, everyone seems to have their phone on them, or two phones on them. So, um, so the way forward to, to get those businesses doing it is to um, shame them privately. <laughs> and, uh, I say shame them publicly. Publicly, maybe, <laughs> maybe a yard sign. No, it's, it's very difficult, and um, the main, the, what, I, what I see works is taking examples from other destinations and then just circulating it and showing that others have done it. You know, that's pretty much the, you know, the evolution of all progress is, is showing that someone else has done it before and that you could do it too. I have a, I have a six-year-old at home, so I'm all, I'm all schooled up on how to motivate children. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, your kids are perfect. <laughs> Their, their dad's a role model, a titan in the industry. Uh -huh. These are all great questions. You are a really great crowd. Um, very good looking and attentive. And I'm um, smart, I can tell, just from your head nods. And um, well, my background is in economics and uh, pricing strategy. And so if you had any questions about you know, how business got done um, in a frictionless world, uh, feel free to let me know and I'll be happy to talk to you. No charge. Thank you.